so you need software to run your headset? Well, no, it automatically updated um, a bunch of drivers when I plugged oh. in the USB. And whatever, like, fucky shit it did was fucky and weird and and required <laughs> and required a restart for the computer to figure to, to you know get its shit together oh okay well i'm glad it's working now yeah me too i and what's weird is it fucked up like the entire settings because i i initially plugged this one in thinking oh it's my nice new one it'll it'll sound good for wade and his and his great new podcast but when it wasn't working i'm like okay i'll just switch back to the older one it might not sound as nice but then that one was just as fucky so I'm like, so whatever driver bullshit this uh, this thing pulled when I plugged it in took a little bit for the computer to uh, unfuck itself, but thankfully it did, and uh, and here we are. So I I just started recording it already. Yeah, no, that's fine. That, but yeah, just, you just can, in case you, you 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 can figure out if uh, if I say anything particularly shenanigan worthy that you can like put in there for for yeah. shits and giggles. Welcome to the Regular People Podcast. Today I'm joined by Nate Godfrey. Nate is a history grad student, and today we'll be talking about history as well as the issue of critical theory throughout history. We'll hear his take on that, and we'll discuss that, among other things. I don't know, how how do you think I should introduce you? I, I called you a history grad student. Does that I, suffice? I, yeah, I'm, I'm a graduate student in, in history, currently working on my master's thesis. Cool. That's yeah. I'm, I'm not, and and it's important to note that I'm not like a hardcore expert on this stuff. I've got significantly more oh yeah experience with it than the everyday bear, and I think I have yeah. significantly more insight on the way it influences our understanding of history than the everyday bear. But there are there are people who have been living and breathing this stuff for thirty plus years and have a significantly greater grasp of the. Because what's weird is when you get into sort of post-structuralist philosophy and post-structuralist like sociology and the way it's influenced so many other like areas of academia it's like you can't it's like you need to have a grasp of a whole host of other things that i only have kind of a tangential grasp of like like semiotics i i understand semiotics is, is such just absolute bullshit that's that's important and interesting bullshit that has a point to it but um it's complicated. Semi- You're familiar with what semiotics is. No, why don't you tell me what it is? Broadly speaking, with my with my layman's understanding, semiotics is primarily a discipline in sociology and philosophy that is the study of symbols. And, and symbols, speaking broadly, includes language. Oh, okay. So, theoretically, in, in this kind of area of philosophy and sociology, there's kind of... And, and this is this also ties in a lot with, with what we're talking about, which with what I told you I... I one of the things I told you I might want to talk about today, which is um, critical theory in history. Yeah. So structuralists kind of pose that there is a structuralist philosophy, which was kind of the... Mo- so you and I both are sort of familiar with Jordan Peterson, right? Yeah. Jordan Peterson talks about the postmodernists a lot. That's really not an accurate way of talking about it. Uh, the, the problem with describing people as philosophically postmodernist is is it's like saying is that postmodernism isn't a way of thinking, it's a condition that we all exist in. Like, modernism was a was the sort of modern post-World War II slash slightly pre-World War II consensus regarding how the West looks at and understands the world and attempts to approach the world and make the world better. And postmodernism is sort of the world waking up in a stupor, realizing that modernism is fucked up and we don't know where to go from there. And... The, the more accurate way to talk about it would be to talk about structuralism versus post-structuralism, where structuralism essentially posits that there is an objective world and there are abstract ideas and language is sort of this intermediary force that allows us to – that allows individuals to sort of adjudicate between those two forces to understand the world meaningfully and at least more or less accurately. Does that make sense? Yeah, so, but, but what's the bullshit with semiotics? When you get to the post-structuralist understanding of semiotics, the idea or observation is that the meaning of symbols changes so frequently and so dynamically, particularly in a modern context, that 
language becomes almost meaningless in anything other than the exact moment in which it is spoken, and any interpretation of language after that point becomes arbitrary. But I mean, wouldn't semiotics, wouldn't that have to involve looking at the moment that this language was made in to understand it? Well, and, and, and this is where the, the, the history comes in, because when you, when you start studying semiotics and post-structuralism in history, what historians have been grappling with for a long time, and, and, we, and this is a thing that, that it's important to note that history as a profession isn't that old. Really, the, the very start of it was around, um, well, started with historical empiricism. There was a German motherfucker whose name I should know because, because I, I read a whole bunch of books about him. I feel like half the people involved in any sort of science are German. Yeah, well, so, well there, yeah. There's a lot of names to remember. Yeah. But, Nate, before we get any, in, into any of this, though, yeah. I would like to start off with an intro or like a summary of who you are so that any okay. listeners can yeah. can know. Yeah, we, we can get into the actual uh, subject matter in a few minutes. Yeah. So you're Nate. Nate Godfrey is I, your I, name. I Or Nathan. They're perfectly interchangeable. Yeah. For the listeners to know, what have you been spending the last, say, five years of your life doing? Well, I, I graduated high school six years ago. Then I then I got into my undergrad in uh, at North Park University in Chicago, small little Christian university that I thought wouldn't have a whole lot of the hyper. I I am relatively conservative, although conservative is a weird title to use because political ideology is such, such a shifting thing. I think I would be better described at this point as as reactionary adjacent but um i was sort of trying to what's so funny about that no, nothing <laughs> i mean okay Continue. tell me later okay um, i was i was looking to sort of avoid the hyper progressivism that i perceived as being kind of a integral part of most university systems at this point and i thought that that by going to a christian university in chicago i could avoid that i could not as it turns out as it turns I mean, out, it's there Chicago. too. Yeah, I know I was in Chicago, but it was like Chicago has enough sub communities in it, some of which are hyper conservative, that in theory it was avoidable. Like, if you go to the right part of Chicago, you have like all of the hyper conservative, like Greek Orthodox churches just in one area that also happened to be near the area that I was going to, but that wasn't the. Oh, okay. So you're hoping to avoid that and were unsuccessful? I was I was very unsuccessful. Well, I didn't appreciate how much worse it could get <laughs> until I, I started going to graduate school in a in a more general kind of larger university at at, a, at Ohio University here in uh in Ohio as as the name Ohio University would, you know, describe. So Ohio universities be more liberal. Well, I wouldn't liberal isn't the right word. Okay. L- li- in the and this is the problem Marxist? with no i wouldn't even say marxist marxist isn't the right word either progressive and except hyper progressive and the problem is progressivism has kind of shifted over the last like century to mean something very different than well not even something very different progressivism didn't used to be as radical as it is now the the progressives and and for lack of a better term, and I, I use this term with some hesitation because it's it's not super accurate. The sort of neo-Marxists or post-Marxists sort of started canoodling in the in the late forties through early fifties, and um, a bunch of philosophers and a bunch of thinkers who were sort of dejected at the state of and the ultimate the ultimate culmination of what they saw as the sort of staple Marxist ideology had failed. And so they started kind of trying to move on to other ways of thinking about things that still had a, a radical deconstructionist and utopian agenda that sort of, I think, is well-intentioned. And it's important to note that it's well-intentioned. I don't, I don't think there's an evil cabal of, of, of you know, mustache-twirling villains trying to, like, overthrow capitalism. No, it's much more that there are people who have there are a large number of people who and and this is also important to note don't even necessarily consciously or even subconsciously accept some of the acts some of the things that are axiomatically wrong but there are enough people who accept enough axiomatically incorrect things in academia that the net impact is sort of the culmination of what was called and what was called for in the 50s by a marxist philosopher as the long march through the institutions which you're familiar with as an idea 
so okay you were trying to avoid this in your college experience before college would you already have considered yourself so, like on the more conservative side i would have considered myself Jason? no i would i would have considered myself stupid conservative and neoconservative well not stupid okay. conservative just not super well read and yeah. had not been as like exposed. conservative by default more or less yeah and then yeah. and then i think i think you having come out of my college experience still conservative and openly conservative too that's that's an important note i wasn't i wasn't one of these people who just kind of kept his politics to himself closet conservative yeah. yeah i was not a closet conservative i was actively challenged relatively regularly and and there were still a lot of things and this is important this is another lesson i've needed to needed to teach myself after i after i hit so the further you get in education, the more you realize that you know very, very little. And it's yeah. important – one of the most important things that, that – and people take that as a truism or, or as something that, that they think – people don't even know that. They need to be, they need to be shown in, in forcefully and at times violently. That, Violent? Okay. I don't know about that. But, I, okay. I don't mean literally violently. I mean like sort of metaphorically taking – like if ideas and knowledge is a cudgel – People ought be beat yeah. over the head with it until they are bloody, maybe dying, definitely concussed, and and through that pain, they will realize that they know nothing and need to approach yeah. almost everything with with if not absolute intellectual modesty or an intellectual humbleness, something approaching absolute intellectual modesty. Okay, I, I mean, I, I agree with the intellectual modesty. Do you think that that's more genuine or like you're better off for it if you come to that realization on your own rather than being beaten over the head with it? I don't think you can meaningfully come to that realization on your own. I think I think people okay. are predisposed to I think people are predisposed to thinking highly of themselves. That's true. And I think people are predisposed to thinking that they have a handle on things because whatever they're doing, for the most part, is working for them. And so right. people's natural biases sort of preclude that realization until it is forcefully sort of thrust upon them. In what capacity was it forcefully thrust upon you? Or was in it? Par well, I think it was, but I, I don't think it was. I think in part, um, it was. It, I was sort of taught the lesson in part during my undergrad through just sort of debate with other people and yeah. engagement with other people and realizing that there was a whole set of ideas that I hadn't critically engaged with and then had to critically engage with. Yeah, but which then, is why I think it's probably good that someone who is conservative goes to a more progressive school because if you had gone to a more conservative school, you wouldn't really be for forced to face any challenging ideas. You'd have just had everybody agree with you all the time. Well, the problem with and and I think there there's some truth to that, but the other problem is I don't see – People with a more progressive and and I, I use the word progressive instead of liberal because I think progressivism in the modern day rejects some of the axiomatic truths that were the founding Basis of liberalism. Yeah, that were the, the founding principles of, of liberalism and the Enlightenment. I, I don't think students who are being fed and sort of and sort of accept these progressive axioms are necessarily challenged the same way I am. And simultaneously, I was not given the tools to build prior to now having built a built a sort of network of people that I can talk to about this who do have that grounding in sort of the philosophical backbone of conservatism or more right-wing thought to sort of understand the nuances of those ideas and that there is just as complex a philosophical base to the ideas that I'm that I that I seem to gravitate towards as there are on the left and those left-wing students aren't necessarily given the chance to challenge themselves or be challenged in their ideas nearly to the degree that I was. And because so most schools are left wing? Overwhelmingly so. It, but, it, I mean, it, is that the it, is that the reason yes. you're saying? Yes. It it'll it depends a lot on the on the area of academia, but the humanities have been all but completely taken over. You are more likely to find I believe it was a Pew research study. And if it was not a Pew Research study, it was a similarly – it might have been a Rasmussen poll. It was one of the more uh, – it's been a few years since I've looked over these stats in detail. But it was one of the more well-known and well-accredited sort of polling organizations. Do you know any that, of the uh, questions on this poll that you're like – Essentially, it was, it was a self it – was, it was just a question of how would you report yourself, oh. your, your stance politically. Okay. It was a uh, – it was, it was a very simple, what do you consider yourself? You are more yeah. likely to find somebody who considers themselves 
Marxist in the field of history, and I think like two thirds of the subcategories of specializations or areas of study in the humanities than you are to find the somebody who considers themselves moderately conservative. Oh, yeah. Okay. okay. So I guess this has more to do with the whole long march through, through the institutions thing and less to do with uh, critical theory, I guess. But or maybe Well, I mean, criti- does, criti- criti- but- critical theory directly is sort of a direct descendant of a lot of those ideas I, in, in my estimation it's it it was certainly born out of the uh out of the frankfurt school which which was an explicitly sort of for lack of a better word neo-marxist project and it's really interesting actually because I, i've had the good fortune to have a very classical marxist in my graduate program alongside me starting at the same time as i as i have who who is very, very familiar and grounded in traditional Marxist theory and is still decidedly a historical materialist, which which is something that the the school of the, the Frankfurt School sort of patently rejected and said this clearly doesn't lead to the result that we want or doesn't work in the way that we want. So a lot of like classical Marxists really just have a bone to pick with sort of the new critical theory progressive left. But that doesn't mean that there isn't a key sort of lineage of the ideology. Why don't you explain for the listener what you mean when you, when you say some of these terms? For instance, uh, you could define classical Marxism. I'm, I'm using classical Marxism as sort of a... Uh, there's some terms that I use more interchangeably than I ought to, like Marxism versus communism versus socialism are words that I use imprecisely. But the better term to use would be... Cl- okay, classical Marxism actually probably works, which is that Marx considered himself actually, before most other things, a historian. And he wanted to understand the world around him and contextualize the place that society found itself in at the time that he started doing his early writings. This was well before the Communist Manifesto in an approach called that he sort of coined, coined called uh, historical materialism, okay. which essentially looks at society as it stands today and the society of the past specifically through the lens of how economic and material realities impacted and shaped where we the place that society found itself in the past and the place places that society then subsequently found its found itself at the time of his writing it's sort of historical materialism comes down to it's all the results of the resources people had access to how they divvied up those resources how those resources then necessarily created a social order when X group of people had control of those resources and X group of people did not have control of those resources. Yeah. And it's material all the way down. There isn't a lot and of room saying, in that. Who are you saying was rejecting the historical materialism? Uh, the Frankfurt School of Philosophy was sort of, um, which was founded broadly by, um, and and I don't mean to, I don't mean to imply there's some sort of. Some people, when when you say that these were like Jewish intellectuals, are going to say anti-Semitism, and I, there is no such thing as a Jewish conspiracy. I am disavowing anybody who is asserting there is a Jewish conspiracy. Anti-Semitism is a blight upon society. That said, well, and and it's it's important to contextualize. I'm not just saying they were Jewish because yeah. okay. So as Hitler rose to power, there were a bunch of Marxist intellectuals who were Jewish who, because of sort of seeing where the, where the chips were falling with Hitler gradually rising to power, didn't want to be in Germany anymore and also didn't want to go to the Soviet Union because they thought that was a shit show at this point, even though they themselves were still Marxist or at least had historically been Marxist. So they fled to the United States. Um, and so these Jewish, Jewish German intellectuals founded what came to be known as the Frankfurt School of Sociology, or just generally the, Fr- the Frankfurt School, which had massive and expansive influences all over academia, particularly particularly the humanities since its founding in the 1950s. And they sort of rejected the historical materialism and the well, and mind you, they were sociologists first, not historians. My understanding of their impact is primarily what it's done to history, or or my personal experience with, with reading, you know, modern journals and modern academic papers on various subjects. But that said, they they sort of rejected the historical materialism and the strict sort of capital and economics focused presuppositions of Marx in place in favor of, what? of in favor of a more, and this is a term that they used briefly before they started using critical theory more broadly, uh, cultural Marxism. 
a, a, a Marxism that it, in, in favor of critical theory, which is instead of necessarily challenging the social order through the lens of figuring out why things were distributed the way they were and, ch- and, and saying that the, that distribution was arbitrary, instead sort of going deeper and challenging or critiquing and analyzing and attempting to deconstruct the sort of social conditions, beliefs, and values that under that, that they, they saw as undergirding a lot of those societal values and material realities. So you're saying they thought the culture dictated the like economic rather than the yes. other way around? Yes. Um, Marx sort of cultural ma- or historical materialism sort of discounts ideas. There's less yeah. of a study of ideas because there's less of a belief that novel ideas can change history so much as material realities can change history. Where critical theory or that concept that ideas cannot change history was sort of rejected by the Frankfurt School. And well, they don't say that material realities don't change history. They say that Marx and his immediate historical, those who worked in the sort of Marxist historical lens, insufficiently did not take ideas as a prime mover in historical change seriously. So before, I think before we started recording this podcast, you said you had a problem with critical theory. So do you, what is your problem exactly with it? Well, it's important to note, I think, first of all, that um, critical theory is in part correct or useful. The way to think about different theories or methodologies, because critical theory is in a sense a methodology, really, um, that challenges things and approaches arriving at truth or reality in a certain way. And I think it is a useful tool when used in a specific context towards a specific end. And and the, that specific context and those specific ends is a lot more narrow than the broad application that it's seen today. And I, I think I think the broad application that it's seen today is more or less what it was designed for because I, I think so tools are made to for different purposes. And I think yeah. one of the one of the purposes of critical theory, as described by its designers in the Frankfurt School, was explicitly the deconstruction of Western society towards a more utopian the deconstruction and then reconstruction of Western society towards a more utopian end that is pseudo Marxist, but not entirely Marxist because it rejects materialism as a you understand. Yeah. One of my problems with it is that critical theory and post and the post structuralism that kind of goes with critical theory results in when applied earnestly, results in absolute moral and intellectual relativism, which is okay. utterly useless abhorrent. as a tool. Not not even abhorrent, but it's it's it gets you nowhere. Like these these methodologies are tools in the same way. A, I, I'm going to layer metaphors on metaphors here to, to, to try to try to explain. Okay. So so if if a methodology is a tool to arrive at truth, it, it's it's something that. You get in, and then it takes you somewhere. Like a car is a tool, right? Okay. Um, okay. So if if traditional positivist, you know what I mean when I say positivist. Yeah, logical positivism. Yeah, like if traditional positivist or or necessarily falsifiable methodologies are something that have more or less brought us to truth. When you approach relativism, relativism is a car without an engine. It doesn't get us anywhere, like at all. Nowhere meaningful, certainly. Nowhere nearer to the right. truth. But the other problem with critical theory is ultimately, oftentimes, it's not applied equally. It's applied very relativistically to, based upon the sort of progressive presuppositions about who does or does not have power and who therefore, and we should automatically default to giving special treatment or special consideration or greater regard towards those viewpoints that have been underprivileged in the past or may not have been given sufficient regard. And there's and 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 when I say that that isn't to say that that is an entirely incorrect or useless assertion or desire because I think there are absolutely and I think it would be folly to say that there were not and have not been historically underexplored or systematically disabused peoples with intellectual with intellectually valid viewpoints 
or ideologies or ideas that shape society that have been rejected in a way that is unjust and not representative of, you know, the best yeah. laid egalitarian values that, that we espouse in the West. So you're saying that your problem with it is more of a application of it because it's something that can be or it has has been used with specific targets that aren't necessarily fair? When, when it is used... When, okay, so for example, here, it's kind of hard to talk about because not hard to talk, it's complicated. Um, critical theory is a tool essentially to point out the problems with the way things are. Yeah. It doesn't, the pro, it doesn't necessarily pose any solutions and it doesn't give us a new methodology. A lot of the humanities right now, and this is something that was told to me explicitly, a lot of the humanities are defined by being stuck with no clear solutions to problems that critical theory and sort of post-structuralist criticisms of positivist or the empiricist approach to history have pointed out or have been pointed out. Critical theory essentially points out that, that our engine, the engine in our car is not working correctly and it sputters and it wastes gas and it occasionally breaks down. Then we need to get out and hammer it a few times with a wrench. And they point out that that's a problem. Right. And then they point us to a car that literally does not have an engine in it as equally valid. Okay, so you were bringing up moral relativism, which I think yeah. you're right, it's something that doesn't really go anywhere. You can't argue for some sort of moral progress if you're a relativist, because you're kind of admitting that your own version of moral progress is no more valid than anybody else's is. So it's just a self-defeating idea. If you're saying critical theory leads to moral relativism... It can but, lead to moral relativism. Yeah, but if you It you've doesn't got, necessarily lead to moral relativism. It leads to something sort of adjacent to moral relativism. So are you more just... Do you have a problem with like capital C, like Frankfurt School critical theory, or just any critical theory? Critical because, theory I mean, is sort of a... Because critical theories are just, like you said, pointing out that this aspect of society doesn't work and we need to fix it, rather than just explaining the aspect of society. Well, one of the things... So if you do have a moral like code at all, or if you're trying to be morally objective, well, and, and, then and there is, is a I'm right saying. way to do something. Yeah, well, there is a right way to do something, and... So yes, th there is a way, and this is the thing. This this is critical theory is useful because it does point out problems, yeah, in certain contexts and in certain ways. And 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 this is something that I'm kind of up in the air about myself in regards to whether or not that truly is a <laughs> pointing out problems is easy. That's yeah. something anybody can do. When any methodology has any methodology and proponents of that methodology have legitimate points about the shortcomings of any other methodology, the the problem sort of comes in when there are a lot of acts other than pointing out problems there are a lot of there's a lot more baggage to critical theory than that because it's okay. uh, capital c, and and so that would be the difference between capital c and lowercase c critical theory in, in that being and and i think frankly when you say critical theory that necessarily is talking sort about of points c. to the capital c because the yeah. the critical theory is built upon an entire set of sort of presuppositions about modern western capitalism western society patriarchy, phal logocentrism, <laughs> that sort of a thing. Do you have any specific examples in mind of instances where critical theory has been, I don't know, misused or used in such a way that it's problematic? So and 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 this is what I've what I've spent the last few days trying to sort of go back and read. One of one of the things I would say is uh, in I, I think the impact that it's primarily had on modern discourse is is the biggest and most obvious problem. I could I could name some specific like articles and specific approaches that um and specific individuals whose writings have some value when taken when taken at face value, but if taken too seriously, can cause a whole bunch of, in my estimation, cause a whole bunch of problems. But but I think the biggest issue is is the impact that the underlying suppositions of critical theory and its various offshoots have had on modern discourse and sort of modern wider cultural exchanges. Like what? Uh, critical race theory is is the biggest one, which is which is um seems to be the underlying sort of guiding piece of piece of um. Not peace, that's not the right way of putting it. It seems to be a, a necessary underlying sort of cornerstone of the discourse, the more progressive discourse around Black Lives Matter and modern racial issues, which does legitimately point out, and, and this is this is this is what I mean when I say it's not entirely worthless, which does legitimately point out systemic issues with race and injustices in the past, but then yeah. sort of excuse sort of excuse the the all the necessary counterpoints to that. Not not to say that it doesn't exist, but there's a lot more nuance to 
sort of modern racial inequity than I think modern proponents of critical race theory allow for or even entertain as a possibility. And there's sort of a – when you – critical theory essentially exists to pick apart positivist or empirical evidence as based upon – a set of standards. Basically, critical theory says the standards that we use to define and measure and figure out how reality works is arbitrary and meaningless. And then as a result of that, you end up sort of raising or placing upon a pedestal personal and the and the sort of archetypal or stereotypical phrasing is is lived experience as equally valid or just as useful of a tool for determining and reflecting reality now that isn't to say that lived experience isn't something that we need to discuss or isn't an extant concern regarding discourse that that needs to be set aside what what that is saying is that people's personal lived experience needs to be measured alongside what, in my estimation, are useful and more or less accurate tools based upon positivist suppositions about, you know, reality. Yeah, like you can't just rely on anecdotes. You need to have actually facts and measured. And like... and, and the problem is it's not just anecdotes. Uh, modern critical race theory sort of posits that there's a collective experience that needs to be reckoned with, regardless of what individuals have actually experienced those things individually. It it sort of posits that people feel pain collectively, which is partially true, but not true enough to meaningfully improve the discourse. How do I say this? It's, it's, oh, I just had a thought. Give me a moment. I I will, I will collect it. That's right. If you can't think of it. Well, no, because it's important. It's, 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 uh, it's, it's like directly related to to what we were just talking about and it's going to bother me if i don't if i don't say it or or think of it which is fuck i'll think of it later at some point yeah come back to it yeah so how do you feel about historical materialism though do you think that's any more or less valid than the you know focusing on i think at least just i i think at least historical materialism is falsifiable right i I think because i feel like both could kind of lead to some of the same sorts of like ideas about maybe how to fix society or where problems are in well, society because they, a lot they of the can, times- they can lead to similar but not in t- but still sort of incompatible similar but still incompatible solutions yeah because well I, I guess what i'm thinking of is if you've got a, like a materialist kind of viewpoint and you're looking at the economics of the situation to see people that are poor throughout society arbitrarily just because of the accident of their birth they're they're poor so they just have the shit under the stick and stick in society it kind of lines up with the whole critical theory side of it you're trying to change society in a way that those people who have been abused are now going to be in a more equitable position so both okay. both cases are I like i remembered what i was saying what i was going to say just a second ago and can i can i okay. get it out before yeah. uh, well, well it's essentially critical theory posits that that or the end result of critical theory is that somebody's lived experience is just as, if not more important, and sort of the collective cultural understanding of reality, regardless of how empirically based that is, is just as valid as the tools that, that Western society built based on sort of ideas about empiricism, empiricism and positivism. It, it basically posits that, that, that positivism is an arbitrary standard – and one of one of the pieces of evidence that it points to to prove that positivism is an arbitrary standard is is the unequal distribution of of wealth or positive outcomes in society. And how does that have anything to do with positivism, though? Why is that the direct consequence of positivism? Well, it, it's uh, I, I don't know if you saw the um, the post. So the Sm- the Smithsonian has a sub like a a, a sub group or a sub museum under it that's specifically the Black History and race racial history in america sort of museum i forget the exact name of it i've not seen that no they just put up a they put up a post a little while ago that was sort of directly reflective of 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 the sort of things i'm talking about in critical race theory which was um and they took it down almost i think two weeks after after it was initially posted because of how much it was it was pointed out to be absolutely ridiculous because it is absolutely ridiculous, but I, I don't think people realize how central or how common these ideas are until it's shoved right in their face in this explicit way. It was um, a list of yeah, so it's the N M A A H C. Let me let me just Google what what that that's the like subgroup of the of the uh, it's the National Museum of African American History and Culture. Okay, uh, is is a you know subgroup 
of the Smithsonian, and they put out this post um, regarding aspects and assumptions of whiteness and white culture in the United States. And there are some things that are legitimately sort of arbitrary social values that differ in other places. And there are some things that are like explicitly utilitarian ideas that objectively result in better outcomes for groups of people. And essentially, the the post-structuralists and the the critical theorists posit that the only reason those things are valued or the, or the only reason those things come to result in a positive outcome is because people arbitrarily value those things. Such things oh, okay. as following a rigid time schedule, time being viewed as a commodity, planning for the future. I, I'll read the whole – basically, there's some things that are legitimately just cultural, like rugged individualism, aspects of the family structure, but then – Emphasis on the scientific method is listed as also a assumption of whiteness. Objective, rational, and linear thinking is, and r- this was put out by by a, a sub a subset of the Smithsonian. Um, objective and rational linear thinking, cause and effect relationships, and a quantitative emphasis. Delayed gratification is a white value. Y- you know, it's it's not the value that literally all of every society that has ever historically been successful or even marginally successful has valued like like in order to in order for agrarian societies in in like prehistoric times to have arisen requires a value of delayed gratification but that's that's well, uh, I think that's, that's what they're getting at I think they're getting at the fact that not all civilizations have been agrarian and many of them no, persistent no, to be hunter gatherers well, no but even even native american tribes had concepts of delayed gratification that, that were that was built into their cult their cultural value set and those that didn't wouldn't have survived yeah the only one of those that i could uh i guess kind of understand was the punctuality one because i know that in some like pacific islander cultures in their language they don't have the same words for time that yeah that we do so they don't even view it as a schedule kind of yeah thing. It, it's just yeah. now is the time and that's all that matters mm-hmm yeah, all those are pretty much just like scientific rigor and understanding the universe in a measurable way. Well, and and, attempt, and attempting to exist in our reality in a way that is maximally beneficial to you and maximally and m- most likely to result in you having a positive outcome. Yeah, that is strange. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it, so it was taken down from the page, I think, two weeks after it was initially put up because of the number of people that were pointing out how absurd it is. But that doesn't mean that it's not representative of core tenets of, of, of critical race theory and core tenets of sort of critical theory as a whole. Um, basically, the, the assumption of if critical theory was practiced evenly, it would lead to absolute moral relativism. But it doesn't lead to relativism because it's, it's not used as a means of – it's not used evenly. It's, it's applied specifically to – Western culture and those that are seen as the oppressors versus the oppressed in sort of progressive and neo-Marxist dialogue. And as a result, you end up with a really haphazard and ham-fisted understanding of reality, the problems of reality, which are not illegitimate problems, but you don't really have a sense of perspective and you don't really have a desire to identify those problems meaningfully and quantitatively in order to address them in a way you, you need to understand the nuances of a problem in order to, yeah. to solve it and the, the sort of conservative or more like right-wing solutions that have been posed to racial issues have sort of been rejected in large part because they don't sound good or they don't sound pleasant even though in my estimation they would so for example um yeah i want to hear some specifics of these right-wing yeah. solutions um I, I don't know if you're familiar with thomas sowell at all he's he's a prominent I've heard the name. Conservative, r- right wing intellectual who, and, and I mentioned that he's black only because I don't think somebody who is white could say the things that he does and point out the things that he does without being called racist. I mean, Thomas Sowell gets called racist, but it's a different kind of thing. You kind of need to cite somebody, and I don't think it's entirely ill. And this is part of critical theory that I don't think is entirely illegitimate. I think there are absolutely cultural and social biases that make that it makes some people more invested in pointing to certain solutions or certain viewpoints that may be more or less inaccurate because of those biases. And I think it's not entirely unfair to say that white America not having suffered from racial injustice and the racial inequity that that black America saw and has seen and, and to an extent continues to see is more likely to – is biased towards pointing toward non-systemic problems. And so having 
a black gentleman who grew up in the middle of, of – because he's, he's old as shit now. He's like – he just had his 90th birthday, <laughs> and he's still writing, and he's still sharp as a fucking – sharp as a tack. A really sharp tack, for the record, not like one of those blunt tacks that doesn't really do good shit. But um, he, he grew up in uh, 1930s and 1940s America in, in the South at the height of Jim Crow in, like, in abject poverty – in a single parent household and grew up a Marxist, like an explicit Marxist up until his, I think, 30s when he sort of graduated. He was working for the Department of Labor Statistics in the United States where he and he gradually sort of started shifting his viewpoints until he became something of a ardent conservative and an ardent and ardently critical of modern racial discourses and sort of the narrative around where the primary problem for Black America comes from. He wrote, um, and he's written about more than just like racial, he's primarily an economist. He talks about a lot more than just racial issues and economics. He also touches on philosophy and some other, there, there's a, br- he's written like 50 fucking books in 40 years, so, or 60 years. So, you know, he's been doing a lot of shit. Um <laughs> But one of the books that I think is a really important read, and I'm not entirely sure I agree with the entirety of his thesis, or I'm not entirely sure he's without fault. So I'm not, the point is I'm not unequivocally endorsing this book. Right. Absolutely. What's but I think book? he's, it's uh, called Black, Rednecks, and White Liberals. Um, one, th- one thing that I would I would say about Soul that I think is is to his absolute credit is he writes on academic subject matter and complex academic subject matter in very, very plain, approachable language for common people. And so he'll have very simple, non-academic sounding titles on his books. But the the thesis of, of Black, Rednecks, and White Liberals is that well, there are abs, and and he doesn't deny that there are racial disparities that that stem from systemic issues. But what he does is he sort of examines the underlying the underlying systemic discriminations that Black America faced in the Jim Crow era and in the post slavery era, alongside other minorities that faced in in the United States that faced similar levels of discrimination, like um the Chinese on the West Coast, as an example. And also, actually, different subgroups of immigrant blacks in the United States who came to America outside of the outside of being born to or integrated into freedmen society. And the, conclu- the the point that he's making, his overall thesis, at least at the beginning, he sort of shifts between different focuses over the course of the book and different like minority groups and how they did or didn't succeed and what the problems with the, their pro- the problems they faced were. But his his core thesis at the very beginning is that there was a specific culture, not actually born of black culture or arrived at or constructed by sort of post-slavery black America, but actually initially was the result of a particular cultural standard that he calls – he as a shorthand, he calls it the redneck culture – that initially arose from 15th and 16th century Ireland and Scotland. Steven Pinker kind of talks about the same thing and the better angels of our nature, mm-hmm. not having to do with black people, but just having to do with people who live in the southern states. Mm-hmm. Well, he, he points out that there was a specific redneck culture, and he, he, he kind of goes into detail about what constitutes that culture and what sort of social attitudes make up that culture, such as like a hostility to intellectualism, sexual promiscuity, a sort of hostility towards – a sort of hostility in general, but but a hostility towards intellectualism and also just a rejection of anything resembling a protestant work ethic in general hostility towards work and labor and he doesn't say well black americans just have this he goes through like really deep statistics about it wasn't that the 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 american south prior to the abolition of slavery and even after the abolition of slavery to an extent and even during the height of slavery when we think of you know all of these big cotton plantation owners suffered from all of all of the the overall majority of the white folks were sort of exemplified what Sowell calls this redneck culture of yeah. s- sort of that did not yield positive social results and then he goes through a bunch of empirical evidence for this where he like um like if you go back to 1810 you can um we have data that tells us the number of milk yielding cows per capita for each of the individual states. And they're actually about equal between the North and the South. 
northern states and southern states with a few like examples of like southern states having way more cows and northern states having way less cows and you know vice versa but um sure. what does that have to do with it so there's a number of things that you can do with milk right yeah. that's labor intensive but then yields significantly more valuable materials that you can either use for yourself or for, or to sell as sort of sure. you know a Cream, capitalist venture cheese butter yes butter is the big one um because we there was also recorded the the amount of butter that was produced by farmers both in the north and the south was measured and even though they had the same number of cows there was almost no butter produced almost ever in the south and well most northerners both made their own better butter and then would and if they had access to extra would then sell it on the market almost no southerners actually had tasted butter or some some of them hadn't even seen butter because they just didn't produce it because it just wasn't churning is hard, bitch. <laughs> is that, do you think that's the most likely um, reason that it's just because it's difficult work and it's not worth doing, even though it is worth doing? Like, In, is it is possible there... that is it possible that there are cultural standards that tell you that butter just isn't isn't worth making? Yeah. Um, and what like, would aside the... from. Maybe like a, a ge- slight genetic difference in people valuing butter less. Perhaps they don't like the taste. Um, well, I'm just wondering I, if I, anything I, like that is possible. That's I, I. I would be very skeptical of there being some sort of genetic difference. I mostly because I. Well, well, because, I'm not. I okay. So, so what? So what I imagine is that if you're some farmer who has some cows. You might be lazy, but you have children and you can make your children do things. And those children might be lazy, but, you know, especially in like the further back in history you go, I imagine that parents had more authoritarian control over their children. Mm -hmm. So if you want some butter, you don't even have to do the work yourself. You can have your daughter make the butter or your son make the butter. And like, Mm -hmm. even though there can, there can still be laziness around, but it's like the authority of of the the parent forcing their child to make butter or else they're going to get whipped. (laughs) It, it seems that, like it would be equally existent in the North and the Southern states. You would think so. But one of the reasons, and, and Sol points to this explicitly, is a lot of the reason poorer folks moved to the South was because of how much of it was still occupied by enough wild game that a lot of people could subsist entirely off the land, significantly more than they mm. could in the North. And so there was a lot less of a need to invest in delayed gratification delayed gratification differs and, and milk is just like the big one that that sticks out to me in my head he goes through a bunch of other like empirical yeah stuff like that regarding the oh oh this is a, this is a good example um <laughs> it was found in the south it was found that a large section of territory in the south would be prime well and generally it's just it's it's a culture that also just doesn't value precision and like being really careful and cautious about things and being like professional it that doesn't value professionalism. That's one of the things about redneck culture that he points to, and he points to the fact that it was found in the seventeen like eighties or nineties, shortly after the Revolutionary War, that um the soil in a huge section of Southern territory was particularly predisposed to growing really, really, really good grapes for wine. And for a long time, you had a they bunch of people. It? No, they tried to use it. Oh. There was not a single successful vineyard that was not owned by a northerner who oversaw and led all the labor. And even those soon died off because the reputation of these southern these southern vineyards became so awful because the quality of the wine that the cuz because there there were successful um vineyards in the south that were run by northerners. Right. But they were outnumbered heavily by the number of smaller sort of family vineyards that were owned by like local less successful or wealthy Southerners who then out that entire territory sort of became associated with the quality of wine that the Southerners put out. And it was so bad that all of the markets that would have existed for it stopped buying. So hold on. I feel like some of what you're saying is actually kind of a point in favor of critical theory of the fact of the concept that the culture is the problem or, or like these, well, no, no, these no, no, things no. Can, can, the, the culture. The, well no 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 I, I, I think you're misunderstanding what my problem with critical theory is um because oh, sure. i absolutely think that the culture that is the true, problem it's just yeah the, okay. well, it, well what critical theory posits is that cultural standards are arbitrary yeah and that there are an entire set of values that we hold as cultural values that are no more valid 
or no more likely to yield positive results gotcha. than another yeah. set of values. And in fact, some of our values, even if we think, and I think it's fair to say that some of our cultural values have objectively quantifiably measurable they are imp- they empirically function and work better than some of the other values that have been po- that you know have been posited as as uh, potential alternatives. That those are just as arbitrary. That that hard work or a Protestant work ethic is an arbitrary social value. That um that time management is an arbitrary social value, and so will end. But critical theory, when applied in in the area of critical race theory, basically points out basically looks at if culture is arbitrary and can lead to pernicious results to the people that don't basically what 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 modern critical race theory posits is that racial values and and races i mean racism is arbitrary yes but there there are things that lead to racial disparity in the modern day that are the results of white cultural values arbitrarily undervaluing black output right so for Soul's book, was the general point that it's not about some sort of systemic oppression on the part of white people that's causing, like... Well, I think it's important to note that he doesn't say that systemic oppression does not have a measurable and... Impact? He just impact. talking... It's, he, he's, he's saying that we... That there has been a... There is a systemic investment in ignoring, overlooking, and not entertaining the possibility that there are other explanation such as cultural that he makes the case that that, and i don't think he ever says because i just listened to the book on audiobook recently again um just i I read it the first time and then i listened to it on audiobook i don't think he ever says that there aren't heavy systemic problems that that result in injustice and inequality but they don't number one they don't explain all of the inequality and they don't explain why the inequality has persisted to the degree that it has particularly when you compare black America to other groups that have faced similar amounts of discrimination in the United States itself and found a way out of that. So is he roughly saying that the cultural issues are, it's like the black people who lived in the Southern States were kind of infected by the yes. white people who lived in the Southern States. Their, yes. Were, it, it, were it their work ethic and their culture? Yes. It is ultimately white Southerners' faults that, that, that black America was given and and this is the thing too right, not, but it's 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 more a problem of southern states culture cultural values black people culture yeah well yeah well and and uh, and this isn't and and this is that this is the thing it's not about well it's it's black people's own fault that they that they and and Sowell goes into this in some detail he goes like this was absolutely an accident of birth and this was absolutely something that you cannot blame black america for having adopted because it was all they were exposed to for generations and and slavery and he absolutely ta- and he talks about like the details of why you know slavery was fucked up and a bunch of other things and what have you but cultural standards are not something that you can fix from the outside in well, I mean, wouldn't wouldn't critical theories approach still no wouldn't it still be um to do it from the inside out though because it's still like you're a member of the culture trying to change it. No, no. I, I think critical theory posits that you need to sy- systematically... The problem is... Oh, so, uh, okay, critical... so you're doing it not on a culture level, but you're doing it on a like system level? Yeah. And you need well, to actually do uh, it on a culture a level? A system level, well, and, it, and it's who needs to do the changing and for what reason. Critical race theory essentially posits that it's the problem, the reason black America isn't succeeding as much as white America is because white America has arbitrary standards that are holding black people back because they don't appreciate the output or function of, of black culture as much as they ought to, because the values that, that white America holds is arbitrary. And okay. what Sowell is saying is that the problem is, and like I said, the problem isn't that isn't with saying that there are cultural issues or that there are, you know, systemic problems. The problem is what sort of solution you pose to them and how you value one person's input over another person's input. And critical race theory specifically puts such a value on lived black experience and the black and the black cultural meta narrative of of oppression and victimhood that it sort of precludes the when when you engage in it and agree with its fundamental presuppositions the way many academics and I think in modern culture we've sort of agreed is the right way to engage with with cultural stuff is to just not be critical because the lived experience of this group of people and the fact that they are oppressed because the problem with critical theory isn't the criticism the problem is the end results of how you take that criticism and who is allowed to criticize what okay and what that means for what needs to change 
so the, the criticism is talking... not the problem with critical race theory. It's the underlying suppositions right. that, that, that that criticism is then built upon. Okay. So before you were saying that the more right-wing solutions to problems like racism often get ignored, but I don't think you mentioned specifically what any of those solutions would be. Do you have any in mind? Well, part of it is they aren't systemic solutions. This is part of the problem. I sure. Think, I, mean, um, I mean, that's that sounds to me more like. Sowell essentially um, says. So, so essentially says you need. We need to just look at them in, differently. Not even look at them differently. Um, you need to. Black America needs to start valuing things differently, and those cultural and and it's hard to do that. That's a hard thing to do, and there isn't necessarily a. I think the first thing to do is you. We start setting actual standards in academics that aren't arbitrary or that aren't that don't control for black academic underachievement. In fact, there, there was an entire book written written recently by another black conservative about his experience trying to get through grad school. And how he was coddled by his 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 teachers and stuff because they didn't feel like it was their place to criticize somebody who came from an underprivileged background. And as a result, he wasn't sufficiently trained in his field to be able to compete with other people. But that didn't really matter because you see the point. Um, you, you, there needs to be a shift in cultural values and how we do that. I think the answers to that varies piece by piece, but I don't think the solution is try to systemically... F- the underlying assumption is that the overwhelming majority of problems that black that black Americans face is systemic racism or a s- systemic discrimination. And I think that is some of the problem. And I think there are absolutely solutions to, solutions to that that are systemic. But I think sure. when you look at the breadth of black America's – the breadth and depth and prolonged nature of black America's underachievement compared to the rest of America – I think then it becomes clear that the solution needs to be needs to come from within the black community ra- rather than from outside of it, rather than it being some sort of systemic change to government or law or the way white Americans interact with black Americans. Well, I think. Okay, I have a few things to say to that. Um, by all one, means, one I I would you know agree partially that of course any sort of change needs to come from within, but also I mean isn't it true that the initial reasons for whatever sort of differences there are in progress culturally or systematically, that white people were the original reason for black Americans being. Yes, I I would agree. Yes. So doesn't that seem, wouldn't it be kind of strange that if a certain group started the problem, that you're putting the onus on the other group to solve the problem? Well, that that assumes that the problem, that an outside group can solve that problem, even if they caused it. So then it's kind of like, yeah, I fucked it up, but you clean this mess up. But I'm not sure there's a way white America can clean up the problem of black culture. I'm Maybe not, not sure. Maybe not entirely, but shouldn't they at least like Absolutely, we should something? at least try. There, there should absolute, I think there are absolutely government programs that we can invest in that would – that would, it's like you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make a drink. But I, but that doesn't mean that we shouldn't lead the horse to water. I, I don't think part of it – and, and Sowell goes into this in more detail, and I'm not necessarily equipped – to I would need to go back and read his specific set of solutions, but one of the things he talks about is the way we structure academia, the way we incentivize, the way we we systematically incentivize growth. He 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 in fact has an entire chapter about black academia and what has worked and what hasn't worked in the past, and then compares it with other minority groups and how they chose to how the system chose to try to educate them and integrate them and sort of the solutions that they came up with. And in part, I think there is truth. I think, yes. Well, it's it's complicated. And Here's a, here's I'm a not... proposed solution for you that yeah. I think is uh, actually f- like fair in the actual sense of the word to mm-hmm. affecting all parties. Yeah. So, for instance, if we adopted a system like universal basic income that gave, say, every household $1,000 yeah. a month, of course, to the people who already have a lot of wealth, that would be basically, and I'm not necessarily opposed to. I'm not necessarily opposed sure. to universal basic. Yeah, and that would be a solution that would give money to white people, Chinese people, black people, all people. And yeah. then it it just so happens that you know because of this, all the things that have happened over the past however however many years that black families have less wealth on average than white families do. So even though the money is going to everyone, it would disproportionately be in favor of black families. So it it wouldn't be a specifically racially targeted program. But it would benefit the people who probably need that the most. And, and it absolutely would benefit the people that need that the most. But would that change overcome 
the set of cultural standards that make it difficult to succeed beyond to to progress beyond that point then it in, in a like, widespread way that would then overcome the 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 inequality in or the the verifiable inequality in outcome right it might not completely overcome that or solve it all in one step but it's i don't know it's kind of like more of trying to solve a problem through many different ways well, the, rather than just the one problem big way. is well, number one, I would say the problem is – I don't think there is one big way. I would agree with you. But right. I think the yeah. onus of the problem – and this is another point that, that Sowell comes to is essentially that cultures can change over time. You just need to put the onus on them to change. And we're not helping black America by not putting the onus on black America to – and and that can sound harsh. And I think it absolutely is harsh. And I think black America was absolutely put into a shitty situation. But – that and and I don't think the solution is fun or fair or is reflective of what my ideal conception of justice would be. But right. that doesn't mean that it's not the most. That doesn't mean that it does that that the solution that requires that Black America change its internal culture. And and I absolutely think there there are things that we can do systemically and legislatively to make that as easy a transition as possible. Yeah. But okay. So to me, it just kind of sounds like the. So far, anyway, tell me if I'm wrong, that the right wing solution to the disadvantage of black America is to just pull yourself up by your bootstraps. Not necessarily, because I I think I think the right wing solution absolutely. um, Well, and it depends on what right right winger you're talking to, because so will absolutely calls for. Well, his first point is that the problem with education in the inner cities and in in majority black areas in sort of, you know, primary school isn't money when you compare like um when you the compare charter schools, for instance? charter schools could be a solution. That I was think what my first uh, podcast was about. Yeah, I think char- charter schools could be a solution. Um I think I-, I think charter schools could be a good solution and I think there's I would I would be fine with subs- with I think it would be an ideal solution to subsidize black Americans going to charter schools. Um I think reinstituting and one of the solutions that that Sowell gives is we need to create a more complex and meaningful system of standardized testing so that we can actually hold those teachers that aren't successful accountable. And we need to remove teaching standards that are arbitrary or that are fashionable. Basically, we need to let teach... If, if a teacher does... If a set of teachers do something that isn't what is traditionally thought of as the right way to teach, but it's working for them, and they're putting out students that are doing better than the other teachers if they're doing something atypical then they should just be allowed to do that shit yeah i agree well and well the 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 thing is soul points to a bunch of examples of when where this happened in black america and the teachers were rebuffed and then basically driven out of their positions Mm. because they were not following the sort of prescribed style of teaching even though the thing that they were doing was significantly more successful and significantly more likely to put out students that were equipped to move on to higher education and there's an was that what kind of decision was that like from the principal or higher like the school board was that yeah it's primarily the the school board and the school board is made up of black people and for a majority black school yes there's a whole set of issues that and and the thing is there's there's a whole set of solutions that that right-wing America poses that the sort of that critical race theory and sort of the American progressive left in in general regards as victim blaming, which yeah. I don't, which I can understand why they would think that, but I think that's based on a set of assumptions that is both unfair, unhelpful, and is the least likely to result in actually raising black academic success. Because I think there are, ab- there, there are absolutely systems in place that put black America where it is, but there are, but one of those things and, and another good example that Sowell comes to is um, a major restructure of welfare, which is a politi- almost a political impossibility at this point, because you can't take once you start giving s- somebody something and they start feeling entitled to it, it's political suicide to retract it from them. But he, um, another big thing that he points to, and one of one of Sowell's major contributions is that um, Black America was progressing economically, progressing and closing the gap between themselves and White America faster. And a black middle class was growing faster and larger and more meaningfully before the – and this isn't to say that the Civil Rights Act didn't do anything, but before the Civil Rights Act compared to after the Civil Rights Act. 
And one of the things he points to in regards to why that is, is he doesn't say the Civil Rights Act was a bad thing. Although I think I think he point there's a specific set of things with there's a specific like small subcategory of things within the Civil Rights Act that he thought were counterproductive. But the larger thing is LBJ's Great Societies program shifted welfare in such a way as to effectively incentivize single motherhood inside not just black communities, but low income white communities as well. Like it wasn't just black America got fucked up by this. But basically, he points to the fact that one of the biggest predictors of social success is having a meaningful two parent household and a community of actual meaningful two parent households. I forget the name of the, the name of the person who did the study, but um, it was a sociologist who essentially pointed out that not only is having a two-parent household beneficial by itself, but that a, another really massive predictor is living in a community of people that all have two-parent households and have a, a you, where you have a network of positive male influence. And Yeah, I remember reading a book recently where in it they were talking about an experiment kind of study that happened, I think it was in, it was in Sweden, where they, instead of having nuclear families, they had a just a kind of commune where the children belong to everyone. Mm-hmm. And then they did that for like five, 10 years and then assessed their happiness and also their learning and all, all sorts of measures that you would kind of deem mm-hmm. a good, successful human being. And mm-hmm. they kind of found it a failure that the nuclear family is actually probably the best or at least the better alternative to... Yeah, but but what, what I'm saying is that having a having a nuclear family is good and indicative of of and a predictor of success in society a really big predictor of success in society actually if you when you control for when you look at racial disparity in the united states when you control for who comes from a single parent household versus a multi parent household the disparity in outcomes oh also when you control for wealth like a white a poor white person coming from a single parent parent household and a poor black person coming from a single parent household have practically no systemic discrepancy in their social outcomes, statistically speaking. Sure, but it isn't, isn't it true that black people are more likely to come from a lower wealth and so one single parent household than yes. white people? And I'm yeah, and I'm not saying that that, I, I'm not attempting to say that, that that means that there is no such thing as racial discrimination. What I'm attempting to point out is that I don't think a lot of the solutions posed, these systemic solutions posed in modern discourse on racial inequity, take the, because there are absolutely people who do talk about the problem of single parenthood in the black community, but I, I'm not sure they take it quite as seriously as it, as, it, as it ought to be. And I'm not sure a lot of the solutions posed that are like the big things that people are lobbying for are in any way indicative of that being sort of near the top of the hierarchy of things that need to be solved. What kind of solution are you not a proponent of here? Um, I think reparations would be counterproductive. I don't think they would actually solve anything. I think you might actually end up with people in a worse financial situation after reparations than before. You know how um, a lot of uh, of people who win the lottery end up bankrupt? Yeah. That sort of a thing. I think an increase in... And Sol, Sol points this out too. I think an increase in or a, a the continued focus on affirmative action is counterproductive and creates a whole host of problems that Black America is st- still having to deal with and is going to continue to deal with. I think restructuring, I think the expansion of the welfare state in its current form, because, because I think universal basic income could alleviate some of these problems and potentially make it easier to fix some of the problems that Black America faces. But I think yeah. that requires a major restructuring of, of the welfare state as it exists right now, like a major restructuring. And most of what I'm hearing doesn't really involve that. Most of what I'm hearing is sort of an increase to general entitlements. Okay, but specifically about like single parenthood, mm-hmm. do you have any feelings one way or another about, for instance, decriminalizing certain things or changing our prison systems at all? Frankly, um, I've I've gotten some conflicting I've gotten some co- conflicting data on that. Well, not conflicting data. I've got conflicting viewpoints from people that I regard as very equipped to talk about the subject, and I think there's absolutely a point to be made about American prison systems and overcriminalization and the way that disparately impacts the Black community. Yeah. I think there I think there is a strong case to be made that decriminalizing a whole host of things, particularly nonviolent crimes, is yeah a solution. On the other hand, there are some academics, including like Sowell talks about this to some extent. He's the person I feel the most comfortable citing, but uh, there's some other. 
I'm I'm cautious to talk about this because there is a legitimate concern that some of this could be victim blaming if if you're you're not careful and if it's not factually accurate, which is which is one one of the reasons that you need to talk about it cautiously and you can't approach it as if you have. I don't think I have all the answers, but I think it's possible. And I have, like I said, I haven't looked looked into this in in great detail, but I think it's possible that some of the cultural standards within the black community have sort of exacerbated the issue in regards to why blacks are uh, imprisoned and found. Now that isn't to say, and, and again, that isn't to say that there is not, that this would not to some degree be, and this isn't to say that this wouldn't to some degree be alleviated by decriminalization and treating nonviolent offenders with significantly more leniency and creating a standard that a different a change in the prison system that mitigates the risk of recidivism have you seen those um like memes of images of two people next to each other one's a white person one's a black person and it's like on the same exact day by the same judge they got like convicted yeah. for the same crimes and then they got completely different sentences yeah um and that's another thing that, that i've that i've heard um some uh you know i i encounter various claims in that regard one way and the other but from what i have seen now there are some things that are empirically true that I have yet, that I have not seen accounted for by more conservative talking points or more conservative sort of counterpoints I should say. There are black Americans are significantly more likely to be tried as adults than white American white, white American teenagers are significantly less likely to be tried as adults than black American teenagers when they commit the same crime. And that yeah. that is absolutely reflective of systemic racism i i have not seen any don't you think there's a sort of feedback loop between systemic and cultural issues for instance if you're kind of downtrodden if you're finding it the system that you're in is against you in that way that you just mentioned like is one example of being tried as an adult you're kind of already at a disadvantage for any sort of cultural change you're going to try to do potentially yes but but one of the one of the points that i think has eluded the conversation so much is that there are minority groups in America that have done it and that have succeeded and have ushered in cultural change within their own communities in a way that maximizes their potential for success. Such as like Chinese? The Chinese are a big example. There's a, there's a specific ethnic subset of Jews that, that had a lot of cultural problems. The Irish is another big example. Um, the, way you, the way you said Jews there. <laughs> Anyway, continue. The Jews. Ugh. No, I, I, J- Jewish people are cool. And uh, one of one of one of the guys who I've I've recently started hanging out with a lot. I, I mean, hanging out with you know, doing Zoom calls with and playing video games with over the internet during this age of of the Rona is a uh, is a is an Orthodox Jew. And I like like really old religious traditions are cool as shit. And even if I don't necessarily agree, like share share the outcome there's a there's a i think there's a utility in tradition that uh, this is entirely beside the point oh no it doesn't matter. orthodox okay. jews are really fucking cool <laughs> but um that's that isn't that one of the, the, the main things of conservatism the utility in tradition and the fear of throwing out the baby with the bathwater kind of thing to an extent, yes. Um, I think there's also, and it depends on what circles you talk to. I think neoconservatism values that a lot less than sort of paleocons. And I think, like neo reactionaries are significantly, like when I say when I refer to neo reactionary reactionaries, they're significantly more critical of and dubious of the idea that we have objectively progressed morally compared to a lot of our ancestors, and they're sort of dubious of the idea that. They think there is a lot more to ancient wisdom and and wisdom that has been passed down through generations and generations and the sensibilities of those people than we are allowing for in modern society. And I think there's a lot of truth to that. Yeah, I think there's some. There's also some glaring problems with that, such as just treatment of like women, for instance, in the Bible. Women or women? Women. Women. I don't know. Um, I, I well. I think number one, you need to account for the fact that depending on what part of the Bible you're talking about, the Bible really is really all of it, even in the lo- New Testament. A lot of the Bible is well, okay. If if your problem is all of it, then then I disagree with you wholeheartedly. But there's okay. there's some people who have specific examples where they'll talk about X or Y thing being depicted in the Bible, and like the, even the in the base, New Testament, the women answer, aren't allowed to to bear legal witness. 
I, I don't know. I, I would need, frankly, my, my theology isn't isn't quite up to date, and my my right. right. I'm I'm just saying. I think there's also some. I am significantly issues with more likely. Wisdom. I am significantly more likely to entertain what what would be regarded hist what would be regarded as radical positions than than other people. But I'm not sure. I I agree. I, I'm not sure that there must be a reason for that. It's sexism. Maybe, but maybe not. Well, because like if you're if you're believing in God, then you believe that God created Adam before Eve, and Adam yeah. has dominion over all animals, including Eve. Yep. Like, I well, and it, see, that's the it's thing. kind of right think, there in the doctrine. Yeah. Well, I I think well, and that's the thing. I think. Yeah, yeah, it is. Uh, we're not going to get into that. Uh. <laughs> yeah, we don't have to. I was I was just saying. Yeah, I can see there's there's ancient wisdom to be had, but there's also ancient garbage, just as there's modern wisdom and modern garbage. I, I would agree. I, 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 I am. The problem is less that I think. That, I think there are more or less optimal outcomes or arrangements for things, and I think in some respects we have more optimal arrangements for in some respects now than we do in others. Yeah. And yeah. frankly, I, I would need to do more, I would need to do some more thinking on some of these subjects and some some thinking on on for for the for the bearing witness thing. I I was under the impression I was reading a section I was reading a section of the Old Testament that seems to contradict that as far as from I think because of um it prescribes specifically punishments for women that did bear false witness on a number of topics, but I don't know. Um, during I, during the whole um. Jesus is come back from the grave. The only people who saw that Jesus's tomb was empty were the women. And that's yeah. supposed, supposedly a really solid point for theologists because ordinarily they they wouldn't even listen to anything the women have to say. They wouldn't trust the woman. But yeah. because because the woman, they actually put the woman as saying this in the Bible. That's how much they like were hinging yeah. on the fact that it's true because normally Now does woman. that does that mean that scripture is proscribing that value set or could it be that that means that scripture and the points that were made in scripture are explicitly just are, are not explicitly proscribing that value set and instead describing it i suppose that's maybe up for debate but i feel like it's more likely to be prescribing something because it's I think, uh i think it depends on well I, not necessarily i think there's significantly more of scripture that is descriptive rather than proscriptive than, than a lot of people allow for Again, I'm not super up on my theology. I'm not. I'm not super good yeah. at this. Um, I, I think absolutely we have we have morally progressed in some areas, but I I don't think there was such a thing as a. Obj- well, I, I'm not sure about this. I I know a lot of people that I regard as very intelligent who are very dubious of the idea of objective moral progress and are very cautious of saying that we are more enlightened now than we were two thousand years ago. We don't, I suppose we don't have to talk about the moral progress thing for a long time, but. I guess what I would say to that is I feel like if people are making the claim that or at least they're dubious of the fact that we haven't made objective moral progress, then I think it's likely that they either are moral relativists or they have some very, very messed up version of moral objectivism in their head, such as the fact that they're angry that women now have more equal rights. Or or well, uh, the the people that, that I am the most likely to encounter having said this are the people that regard abortion and the amount of abortion that takes place in the United States as one of the greatest societally instituted evils to have ever happened. I do know a few people like that who abortion is their basically only concern. They will, if as long as a president is anti-abortion, they will vote for them no matter what else that president stands for. So I, I think there's that. a... I, I think if you, I think there's a case to be made for that. In fact, I probably would agree with that. If, if you regard a fetus as morally equivalent to and equal of the and worthy of the same moral consideration as as a born human being then abortion is effectively murder of of millions and millions and millions of people every year that it that, that's systemically protected in a way that 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 person if they believed that set of presuppositions which frankly I think I do would is um required or or if I legitimately believe that to be the case, it is incumbent upon me to do everything within my power to stop that from happening. Yeah, but then I wonder how much of, or like, what the abortion rates throughout history are, because obviously abortion has been happening, not just since Roe versus Wade, yes, but it's been happening. But, so I wonder if it's always been happening necessar- at the same kind of 
rate? No, it hasn't always been happening because... at the same kind of rate. It, it explicitly has not. Do you know what the, the rate is now? Is that something you're um, well-versed in, abortion? Uh, I know what the rate is now in certain parts of the country, not necessarily in the whole of the country, but I know that there were more babies aborted in New York last year than there were born. And and what I know of the historical way abortion was practiced and the way that it was frowned upon and was in fact a legal offense, that it would be impossible for things to happen at that scale, particularly when you were significantly less likely to know you were pregnant before it was showing and obvious, then it, it would be logistically impossible for, for, for abortion to happen on that scale without the authorities knowing and there being explicit sort of logistical societal allowance for it. Right. So I feel like we've been talking about the critical race theory. I mean, not for the past 10 minutes, but we've been talking about that for a while. Is there another aspect of critical theory that you take issue with? Oh, I mean, critical race theory is, is, is the example that's most pressing because of, you know, the recent stuff that's been going on. But there's a there's a huge number of, of things that that um that I that I take exception to. A lot of them ultimately do boil. A lot of them have direct antecedent or direct examples that ultimately result to some degree or another in a lot of a lot of critical theory is how you treat and account for despair. A lot of the results of critical theory are problems with the way you account for and talk about historical disparity and modern hi- disparity and how you construct narratives or particularly in history it's it's about how you construct narratives about the past and whether or not you think it's possible to meaningfully reconstruct the past at all and and there's a lot of really really troubling implications regarding critical theory and post structuralism specifically such as um here let me let me let me quote from this this section of my book that my my uh, book specifically on on critical theory that i highlighted which is that uh post structuralist and critical theorists argue that language as well as representing the world is creative of it language and texts as collections of signs are thus reconceived as a sh- social and political force for which the entity for which no, for which entity the term language is insufficient. Language, in its multiple multiple meanings, has therefore been replaced in post structuralist parlance as discourse, a linguistic unity of. Okay, that's that's the wrong section that I just had. Okay, no, here. <laughs> Taking account for post structuralist theory, therefore, results in plural mutable readings and interpretations, and much of the critique of post structuralist incursions into traditional historical practices revolved around this issue. Fundamentally, post structuralism supports a relative a relativist position that destroys any claims to historical objectivity. Uh, essentially, because language is so mutable, and because we study the past through primarily textual sources because because yeah. history history as a as a prof- like anthropology and what the fuck is is archaeology are more about taking non-textual sources history as a profession is primarily about textual sources because language is so mutable in the according to critical theory and because meaning the meaning that derives from the symbols that make up language and discourses as a whole is so mutable then our interpretations of those discourses and the way we use those discourses to reconstruct the past are necessarily arbitrary. Like the way I interpret somebody's writing about the past to figure out what the past was like is arbitrarily based on my modern conception of language and therefore is a fiction of my construction. And there is no meaningful way to determine if my fiction is more or less accurate than somebody else's fiction. So are they sort entirely of, discounting history? Well, no. The stance that's taken, then, if, if, if everything is relative like that, then you need to construct history as a narrative that serves a certain social end. And uh, who was it that's... Basically, um, there, there was another historian talking about this this challenge of, of post-structuralism and, and critical theory saying uh historians are failures now and we can't we can't meaningfully reconstruct history in anything resembling a um resembling an objective way but we need to content ourselves with being happy failures and i and i think that's that's not useful <laughs> And I think it it lends itself to and explains why so much of history has tended towards radical progressive narratives that discount the nuances of the subject and sort of lend themselves to the sort of oppressor versus oppressed 
version of history that's sort of become our mainstream understanding of a lot of issues. Now, that isn't to say that 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 that, that, that narrative is entirely without a place, because I think it, it does have a place, but it's being sort of given a premium position and is being held up as sort of the standard narrative that can make up a lot of history. Do you have a different position in mind for a standard narrative? As, I think as I, 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 I don't think the press is there a different way to look at it that you think is maybe I, I, more. I'm well, mainstream? and see that that's something that I'm I'm reflecting on. I'm not sure. I think it depends on where you are and what you're talking about. Um, I don't think critic critical theory in will invariably result in that narrative where I think a more nuanced or a more accurate and potentially useful historical mode of inquiry will net a significantly more varied set of narratives and understandings of the world based on the subject that it's studying so like situationism kind of thing instead of uh if this were like moral instead of moral relativity it would be moral situationism where you have to account for the specific context of the situation to find out or to determine what's right or wrong i i <laughs> so then to determine what's that, right that's, or wrong that's, historically that's, that's, what's factually not, correct not, not not even that what what i mean is what you need to understand is is ultimately historians do need to deliver what we what we research and what we explore in a narrative we you can't yeah. just spit out what all of this all of the data and research and primary source information that you've that you've given to that you've spent years and years researching for your book to the reader to to the person who wants to learn about history raw you, 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 historians yeah. are the cultural bards that take in this information and turn it into a meaningful narrative that then people parse and understand and interpret. And critical theory invariably results in one kind of narrative. And I think a different, I think there are a variety of modes of, or people who, who, invest too much in the because that's the thing a lot of the people who people who accept too many of the axioms of critical theory and accept too many of the, the presuppositions of critical theory will invariably end up with that narrative because i think there are a lot of historians who are not explicitly historians that utilize critical theory there are a lot of historians that use a little bit of critical theory here but then accept x or y base underlying assumption of critical theory, like uh, an idea of like radical constructivism or relativism or the placing of lived experience upon a pedestal. And that sort of, even though they aren't necessarily taking part in critical theory as a whole or in any way that an academic would call like by the book critical theory, still has a net impact on their work and on the narrative that they produce to invariably result in an oppressor versus oppressed narrative. So you mentioned lived experience, and you already said before that you don't think lived experience should be perceived as more important than like empirical evidence. But what kind of weighting do you think lived experience deserves to have? Well, it, it depends on what the what you're trying to do. I think lived experience is important to understand the... But do you think it like it should have some, like it's yes. some importance, but not... Absolutely. Okay. It should have some importance. Um, there was a... I can I can leave... I can really quick run to, run to my library, which is, you know, just like half a room away from me where I've got all the books that I had to read last semester. And one of them was, um, I think, a sort of... a Both a good and bad example of what I'm talking about, where um, this historian... And it couldn't get... it Because of the way she wrote it, couldn't get published in a academic journal or by an academic paper or by a university press, but was published by, you know, just a, just a, a non-academic publisher as a read essentially as an academic work by people who take her work seriously where and and i can grab the book so i can remember the name of it um if you'd like or we can just talk about it in the abstract if you'd like but i'm not sure listeners would want maybe maybe listeners would want to know what i'm talking about and look at the book themselves and decide for themselves because i don't want to yeah get the name give give me just a sec I'll, i'll run over there and i'll grab the book well there he goes still hear me what was that can you hear me I can. You sound different. I sound different. Oh, now you don't. Okay, it was just I needed to move my mic slightly. Okay. So the, the, the name of the book is Wayward Lives, Beautiful Experiments, An Intimate History of Social Upheaval by uh, Sadia Hartman. 
And it's sort of the archetypal example of both, depending on, on how you approach the book or perceive the book as a work of history, a um, potentially useful work to sort of understand a particular cultural perspective, or a work that places the lived rather than lived rather than sort of quantitative experience of groups of people at the forefront of the work to the detriment of, of other of other viewpoints to such a degree that it's it's effectively the book is all, parts of the book are almost written like a play essentially um, the beginning of every section of the book has scenes with characters that are sort of some of them are real historical figures that did not actually show up or meet the fictional characters that the author is writing about. And like like W. E. B. Du Bois, or um, she has like a, a a chorus, like um, like like a a traditional like Greek chorus. Yeah. She, like the the beginning of the book has a list of cast of characters, and some of some of the work is like a legitimate analysis of of the claims that she's making. But it, the problem is, and and it does point to, and there are discrete individual pieces of the book that highlight really specific niche aspects of people's lived experience that can give you an understanding and an empathy for a group of people that had to deal with a specific set of problems in the past. But if you treated it as, as a piece of history that's representative of a qualitative reality or a quantitative reality, then you end up with a very narrative-driven concept of history that is exclusively about how the white man held the black girl down and how the black how the black man held the white the gay white girl down or no the gay black girl down how how the black man held the gay lesbian black girl down and that's not necessarily representative of or it's 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 what i say now when i say historians need to need to tell narratives that is true but those narratives need to be nuanced and reflect a sort of the the much more multifaceted reality of what is going on than I think a lot of the lived experience narr the, the narratives that are solely based on are primarily reflective of lived experience as sort of a source of evidence and as um as the textual and as the the textual sources that you're using reflect then that methodology that, do you see any way that lived experience can become sort of quantitative evidence such as if thousands of people like when you when you take thousands or hun hundreds of thousands of very similar stories and you add them together that kind of makes it statistic maybe but but the problem is when you're when you're using historical sources and like a, a lot of um a lot of the the sources that were used here uh by by hartman were um just girls journals and their personal reflections well she did look at a lot of them you end up with sort of a um what is the wrong looking for a there's a specific word in statistics for this that that I that I um, am having trouble conjuring here, but uh, you you. I'm not sure what this word is. People have a bias toward talking about certain things in their reflections and in their writings over other things, and you yeah. you will end up with the sensibilities of the speaker and what they determine is and isn't important. Well, and also you end up with a telescoping effect where you are less likely. The source, the the diaries that we think of as historically important that are surviving are more likely to reflect the specific interest of the person trying to study those things than those many, many, many sources that did not survive. There's Is that sort not of a, generally true of like any sort of historical document? Well, and and this is the thing, sort of yes, but. It depends on what you're doing and for what purpose, and and that isn't to say that. Well, and this is the thing too. I think there there is a set of criteria that you can meet in order for lived experience to be reflective of a, of a statistical reality, and that isn't to say that lived experience can't be reflective of, of a statistical reality because I think it can, and I think using it as a potential indicator of statistical reality and more, you know, yeah, quantitative sources is it's not bad but as a methodology when not measure it becomes non-falsifiable do you see what i'm saying i feel like a lot of things in history are that way too though because not necessarily if, if the few surviving documents you find talk about how a battle took place on this date at this place and you have three pieces of paper that say this well, it depends that's, on what that's all and, you have. It's kind of the it's kind of the same as finding a diary about somebody's life. Well, the, like, the, not necessarily because the the methodologies and the way you how do I say this? Part of the problem of more modern history of of 
study of contemporary history, which is like any time within the last 140 years is considered, roughly speaking, what contemporary history means to historians means different things. But one of the pro- there's a unique set of challenges that contemporary historians face that more ancient historians do not, which is that, well, ancient historians are trained to sift through dirt, metaphorical dirt and rubble to find the scraps of paper that they can then put together into a meaningful picture. Contemporary historians need to sift through piles of meaningless bullshit that all say things like, hi, I'm Paul on them. And they, they will... Sp- they, they spend their lives and hours and hours just sifting through the pile of meaningless nothing that has been preserved because it's so much more recent in order to reconstruct the past, in order to find that which is meaningful in order to reconstruct the past. And that, and that creates a certain set of problems. That, and this, this is a legitimate criticism of that more progressive historians – post-structuralists and critical and people who accept some of the axioms of critical theory have pointed out, which is that it's the personal biases and interests of or standards that a historian uses to determine what is or isn't admissible as evidence for reconstructing the past is potentially arbitrary. Does that make critical theory more relevant to just contemporary history rather than ancient history? Yes, but contemporary history is a lot of primarily what critical theory talks about. The majority of the time, I, I I can't think of a lot of ancient historians that uh that that even sort of come close to to Does that uh kind of mean that ancient historians are typically less progressive than not necessarily. It means that the thing that they are working on is less likely to have an explicit modern progressive end, and so their political predisposition is significantly less likely to show up or be reflected in sort of the meta narratives that they're creating. Now that that is and again that isn't to say I think it's a legitimate criticism that historians like I as a historian am less like need to be careful about not treating lived experience or personal narratives that are reflected in a historical record that I'm that I'm that I'm looking through as less valid or let my biases or desire to see history in a certain light or discount certain aspects of the more like progressive or left leaning meta narrative of history. I, I need to be really careful about not letting that, not letting my biases force me to or have me discount those sections of the record. At the same time, I don't think that means that the people doing the inverse are any less likely to do the inverse. Yeah. So I suppose the biggest example throughout history of like a famous diary is the diary of Anne Frank. Mm -hmm. does that only become like a useful historical evidence in like conjunction with the hundreds of thousands of Jewish bodies that you find in death camps? Like if you didn't have those Jewish bodies, then like all you had to go on was Anne Frank's diary and like you can't be sure if the Holocaust ever happened. Well, I I think only had, if you only have that, that uh, like subjective, if that was the, okay, if that was, are you saying that that would literally be the only piece of evidence? Then yeah, that would, that would cast into doubt whether or not the the Holocaust happened. But, but I think, I think there's (laughs) such a mountain of, I, I, sure. Yeah. Yeah. And I think enough people having enough of a lived experience um, okay. and reporting that lived experience can absolutely constitute evidence. Um, right. So, okay. So imagine like if we have right after World War II, we have tons of people talking about the death camps, but we don't have any actual death camp physical evidence. Would a historian still kind of believe that it happened? Do we have people that we can statistically verify have gone missing? Like th- there, there are other places we can go, but I think right. it would definitely it would definitely serve as a viable lead to start. Like, let's say the Nazis managed to just destroy all evidence of the death camps ever existing and managed to make it look like you know fully planted forests somehow. Yeah, there would there would be ways I think using the lived ex- the the claims and the observations of people who lived through that horror to then verify that experience through other through other medium and other means. Does this become a problem? Like, does this compound throughout history? For instance, if in 400 years, people are looking back on World War II, and now it kind of becomes like all this quantitative evidence was done by past historians, and that could itself be some subjective thing that somebody made up. Well, we th- th- what's different is once the 20th century rolled around, we as societies started being 
really goddamn anal retentive about recording stuff and having means of keeping that stuff recorded. I think based and so like today we still have a fuck ton of if not all of the prime immediate primary source evidence and like f- like written field reports by people who actively lived in the middle of the, who were actively in the middle of the second world war we practically have all of those field reports still recorded i was digging through a bunch of those for my uh master's thesis recently um and a bunch of them are being and they're being digitized at an absolutely tremendous rate yeah so not likely so not it's it's not unlikely either because some doubt in the future yeah the, the I think the problem in the future is going to be more what evidence do we trust and how do we and how do we trust this evidence over this other evidence and that is a problem and but I don't think that means that the, that the history that we do does not need to be approached rigorously and approached in a way that allows for some body of evidence to like the problem isn't when I say something needs to be falsifiable what I mean is there needs to be some hypothetical piece of information that you can get that would contradict the narrative that you produced yeah but even even then you could have a falsifiable diary yes what i'm not saying what, what i'm saying isn't that here i, th- I th- you might be missing the point or maybe i'm missing the point that you're about to make but l- let me let me kind of get through it and then we'll then we'll figure sure. out who's being the asshole here it might be me it probably <laughs> is me but we'll figure it out <laughs> What what I mean is, if you take uh, Wayward Lives and Beautiful Experiments and you try to figure out if Wayward Lives and Beautiful Experiments takes the journals of here, let me let me look at the number of her number of sources in her uh, in her notes. She she each of her characters sort of represents the the meta. Each of the characters that aren't historical figures in this book represent the sort of zeitgeist of black women or black lesbian women in America, depending on what period, because she goes through a few different like decades and a few different characters in specific contexts. And it can be useful in, it's useful to understand the lives of specific individual people or specific, even hypothetical individual people. But it's different to, it's different if you try to universalize that experience as the common experience or as the understood experience that was standard for the time based off purely the data, the primary source data of the, of, of that lived experience and not have my, my, what I suspect is it would be hard for Hartman to, and, and, Maybe this is unfounded. I'm I'm still trying to figure out where I stand on some of this stuff myself because I think and Hartman I think and Hartman's work here in Wayward Lives and Beautiful Experiments is, is a good example because it can be useful. It's a question of how reflective of objective reality something needs to be to be understood, and I don't think it needs to be entirely reflective, but I think it needs to, we need you need to be careful about integrating subjective lived experience that isn't. Subjective lived experience can be a good way to personalize and contextualize the nature of human suffering or human experience. But I don't think yeah. by itself or without sufficient alternative sources, it can stand on its own as a means of reconstructing reality accurately. And and th- and it's sort of this is this is the problem with um and this is the disagreement that that different historians with different backgrounds or suppositions about what history ought to be have. Some historians think that history is all narratives and that the things that aren't strictly – there is no meaningful way that you can accurately reconstruct history without reconstructing it using narratives that warp – how do I how did I put it in the, in the paper that I wrote on this? Um, well, I can see a problem with the kind of side of if you require some sort of quantitative evidence alongside these lived experience – pieces of evidence that could probably just leave out a lot of aspects of history because I could imagine there are tons of situations throughout history where there is no evidence of a thing happening yeah aside from the lived experience of it like just because people wouldn't wouldn't be recording in in an empirical way what happens to lesbians in 1700s mm-hmm. so then the only word you've got to go on is what the lesbians had to say yeah yeah fair and to, um, and to, to, to discount that just because you don't have any quantitative evidence seems kind of absurd i i would agree i i i would agree with that 
what I suspect is, what I would say is you, you do have quantitative evidence about the laws. We, you would have quanti- because Wayward Lives and Beautiful Experiments starts in like 1910. It doesn't go back that far. But I think there are significant, there, there are significantly more, those, those lived experiences are important and need to be measured, but they need to be measured and understood alongside and contextualized within. And it needs to happen both ways, but how do I put this? You need to be open to your narrative being wrong or having, or having pieces of evidence that contradict certain nuances of your narrative. And yeah, that's definitely true. Generally speaking, academia and history today is very open to the challenging of one kind of narrative and is very hostile toward the challenging of another kind of narrative. And that isn't to say that the narrative that's being produced the narr- I think I would ha- I would be significantly less concerned about critical theory if there was more room in academia for it to be criticized. And right now there just isn't. Right now you don't the humanities have basically been taken over by people that taken over it implies hostile intent people historians who the humanities in general i should say are very positively inclined toward critical theory and you are very unlikely to make it far or be published or be taken seriously at all trying to criticize the conclusions arrived at by people that apply sort of post-structuralist logic or critical theory as a whole. I did, Yeah, I did have some questions about that aspect of it, like the long march the, through the institutions kind of thing. Um, mm-hmm. Well, I, first, why do you think that is? Is it kind of like a, just like you said, if you're going to be a historian, you feel pressured to, to view history from this lens in order to be successful? If you want to be published, yes. And if, and it's all about being published. To be taken seriously, you need to be published by an academic journal. So then rather than being some sort of change of mindset from within, because like you actually just decided to look at history through critical theory, you are doing it from like an outside influence? Is that what's happening? Or the only people who, or the only people who are allowed to meaningfully be successful at this point are the people who unabashedly believe in critical theory. And, well, and, and, the- it, and it depends on what subset of history you're working in, but history overall, particularly social history, is ruled by that approach. And do you think, I mean, obviously people are wrong all the time, but what do you think, like, all these people have gone to college and they've spent their lives studying stuff. Is it really all that likely that all of them or the majority of them are just wrong? Well, it depends on what you mean by wrong, but I, I, I don't think people believing things. I think intellectuals have a very long history of being very wrong about a lot of things. And I think there are some ideas that are so absurd or that I think there are some ideas that are so absurd only intellectuals and academics could could yeah, could believe before. them. So it's just a fashionable idea and it's It's a fashionable standard that aligns with a set of progressive values that that academia overall has been predisposed toward for a long time but has sort of come to a fruition in the last 2 or 3 decades. Yeah, I I could see like I I get how people are wrong all the time about things but on the one hand, then I, it kind of seems like strange to me that so many people in academia would be progressive. That like it's it seems like to almost need a different explanation. Well, that wasn't always the case, right? It used when, to be. Is there a time when like when do you think that transition? Well, in, in the in the nineteen tens and twenties, academia was very conservative, like socially conservative, politically conservative. You had a a lot of almost every major surviving university or or academic institution today started out as a seminary. What do you think changed that? Did they realize that eugenics was a bad idea? Well, no. So it, then... Well, a- actually, it was progressives were actually the primary proponents of, of eugenics back in the day. It was, it was an idea that was associated with social progressivism. I, I think it's there is a tendency for people to understand history, and and this isn't to say the Nazis were the Nazis were secretly left wing or whatever. That's that's not what I'm saying. What what I'm saying is our idea of what constitutes left and right in the modern context is warped by definitions that sort of preclude the left from being the bad guys in 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 a kind of sneaky way. Yeah, I could see that. I guess because the very essence of conservatism is to re- to 
be against change. I disagree. Well, it it depends on what you you mean by conservative. Well, it depends. The word conservative strictly and and people... The word conservative does strictly mean that, but I think rather than being against change, people that we have historically classified as conservative, not all, but a large portion of them, it's not that they disagree or it's not that they don't want change, it's that they want a very different kind of change than the people we would classify as progressives. They want to change back. Not even necessarily a change back. What you're positing is that there's sort of a linear progression between backwards and forwards. Well, and I mean, a change, a change back to the way it used to be, not like... I don't even think, I don't even think uh, that's, that would be a fair characterization, because I think there's a lot of even reactionaries who want something different than there was in the past, but want to take lessons that were learned from the past and aspects mm. of what was, what was present in the past and alter it in a way that reflects or is reflective of things about the present. It's just a very different set of underlying assumptions and solutions than you traditionally get from a more progressive understanding of... Uh, history and culture so what do you think accounts for the usually progressive nature of heroes in stories like movies or books or oral tradition what do you mean prog- or, like even you, in oral tradition you, usually like heroes of stories are you know f- fighting for like the disadvantage of the common man or they're like they're well fighting for the disadvantaged could well be a conservative value it's a question of whether or not i think i think Heroes as agents specifically of change in sort of cultural meta narratives is a much newer phenomenon. I think, think that's, that's primarily uh, the result. Part of I think the sneaky that's, sneaky no, I don't think change. that's part of this. I, well, and, and this is the thing. I don't think it's sneaky. I don't think there's a cabal of people intentionally doing this. I right. think there's, I think there's a web of ideas that have gradually morphed over time that people earnestly believe in, and they're not being secret about it. They're not trying to hide it. It's just they have certain implications that I think the majority of the people who accept the axioms do not understand, and the people that do accept the axioms aren't necessarily being sneaky, but they're obtuse. Is that not any less true for, I don't know, both sides of any sort of political disagreement, that most of the people don't fully understand the implications? Maybe, but to an extent, yes. I'm not even sure about that. My 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 perception is is that the the axioms that sort of make up reactionary or right wing thought are significantly more self explanatory, or or are significantly less, if not self explanatory, significantly less revolutionary. The there's a difference between re- change does not necessitate revolution, and. Um, The way we conceptualize change and the way we conceptualize whether or not it's positive or negative and the way we then interpret whether or not revolution, either ideological, cultural, economic, social, is justified or not. The the progressive the progressive assumption seems to be that change needs to come through revolution. And I think it's it is a result of a changing meta narrative that is sort of the natural end result or progression of liberalism. And this is the thing. I, I I think liberalism, there's a lot of things that liberalism gets right, but I think there's a lot of things that liberalism got and continues to get very, very wrong. Some of the underlying sort of axiomatic assumptions about humanity. Like, Such that as, like, like what? When people can, one of the like presuppositions that was like explicitly written during the French Revolution is that people, when they gather together, are capable of being rational and acting rationally and voting rationally and doing so well identifying what their own interests are and what would be good for them. Yeah, I definitely agree with that. I think that's untrue. (laughs) I think that's patently untrue. Yeah, and I mean, in the same way, not entirely related, but in the same way, I feel like capitalism itself rests on those same notions that people know stuff, like they have access to the information, and they know what's best for them. And neither of those things are true. I think, maybe. Frankly, I'm a lot less wedded to like neoconservative or or neoclassical classical or neoclassical economics than I used to be. I think yeah, that's I just possible because that it seems to me that a lot of the more conservative side people are usually more in favor of capitalism than progressives are. Yeah, I think that's possible. What I suspect, I think it's possible that that's true. Although, what I would, as just kind of an off the top of my head counterpoint, it seems to me not that um. That number one, capitalism isn't necessarily an ideology, and when we talk about it as an ideology, that's actually kind of taking part in 
a pseudo-progressive, pseudo-Marxist discourse. Capitalism isn't necessarily an ideology or reflective of an ideology. It's a utilitarian way of organizing things. And it's only utilitarian insofar as it results in better outcomes than the alternative. And there are a few alternatives that I'm willing to entertain other than like a free market that I think could potentially work, or there are limitations that can be put on the free market that could potentially work. I'm a lot less wedded to the idea that that a free market is by itself like a functional thing that just works perfectly and magically. But I think it's definitely possible, and I think a case has been made, has meaningfully been made, particularly Sowell, actually, another book that he wrote, Basic Economics, is, makes a really good case of this. I'm not sure I wholly agree with him. I would need to read some some more works to the contrary to uh, meaningfully come to a conclusion in that regard, because economics really isn't my, my forte. I just like the way Sowell writes. I think there is a case to be made that the results that, well, people aren't can't meaningfully identify what is good for them when they aren't trying to do so collectively and their collective intentions are not the thing driving the whole of society, the degree to which that's a problem are different. Yeah, but like the classical liberal weren't entirely democratic. That's why we you know, live in a democratic republic is because there's a certain realization that, yeah, people can't or don't know what's best for them so that we have to institute people who are responsible for knowing those things. <laughs> To an extent, yes, and I think the United States has this problem significantly less than a lot of European countries. To an extent, yes, but I think that the problems endemic to... I'm I'm not sure whether or not I think democracy is a bad thing, but I do know that we tend to invoke democracy as an absolute moral imperative when I think there is sufficient evidence that it is not an absolute moral imperative and has significantly greater pitfalls than we necessarily allow for allow for in our models. And I think in the specific feedback system, free markets as a means of understanding and organizing organizing the distribution of scarce resources that have alternative uses, one of the things that's good about it is that people have very immediate and consistent means of giving feedback to the system. And also that the results of the feedback that they give are significantly more clear and are allowed to be significantly more based on personal taste, where the incentives for politicians are very different. They're very irregular, and they are also very likely to Politicians are significantly more likely to run on what is popular rather than what works, where if something ultimately doesn't work and you buy it, you are significantly more likely to know that than you are to be able to... If, if I buy even a complicated machine, right, that I don't understand how it works, my computer, if I bought my computer without building it, or even if I tried to build it and it didn't work, I would know that it doesn't work, right? Okay. When you vote for a politician that institutes rent control which I think is one of the most obviously and objectively failed policies that is still commonly practiced across the United States, you don't have the means of observing whether or not that policy that you voted for meaningfully worked and are significantly more likely to, and your emotions are significantly more likely to to make you like the emotional feedback of voting for that thing and the narrative that is constructed around voting for that thing and therefore you aren't necessarily getting the feedback of whether or not the thing that you just purchased meets the requirements the same way. The thing that you just voted for, it's hard to measure whether or not that thing meets the requirements apart from how it impacts your sense of narrative and place in sort of wider political tribalism. And I think in capitalism, you are significantly more likely to be able to measure whether or not something meets the standards that you would like them to meet. Sure. But like with capitalism, the ideology there is in believing that a free market works and you could still have... Well, it depends on what you mean by works. You could still have a system that's like generally using capitalist ideas of instant feedback, like you were talking about, giving your money to people for things. And then if what you got in return was of value to you, then you do it again. Mm -hmm. But without all the pitfalls of a free market system that... Such as? Well, such as the tendency toward monopoly is probably the biggest one. Because if you start in an initial state of capitalism... I'm not sure I'm not sure there is a... San, well, okay, th- th- and this really depends. I th- and this isn't to say that... I don't think most neoclassical economists are absolute free marketeers. I think, I think, right. 
I think the like pillars of ne- not classical but neoclassical economics are significantly more open to certain kinds of government intervention in specific situations yeah. and regulations that then is allowed for it's just the kind of regulations and the me- and the times in which the regulation should happen are significantly more specific um like Milton Friedman called for a universal basic income that was his solution to poverty and certain problems with taxes and also was heavily in favor of trust busting as a necessary measure that governments need to take. I I don't yeah, I yeah that's my point. Well yeah then I agree with you there. I think I I think that isn't to say that democracy doesn't work or or we should abandon democracy, but that is to say that some of the presuppositions that we have about democracy and sort of li- liberalism the, the the fruits that liberalism has borne as a whole might have more problems than we grant. And in fact. I, it's possible that sort of liberalism's metaphysic base, the sort of drive that gave birth to the ideology in the first place, is so wrapped up in a problem and a context that is so is now foreign to us that it's bound to be corrupted. Which is that, it, in my estimation, liberalism is is bound up in ideas of. Uh, Monarchy. It's it's uh, liberalism is is bound up in in anti-monarchism as sort of its base founding metaphysic, and I think that that might make the fruits that liberalism bears likely to be corrupted toward radical progressive ideology. Because w- when you when you no longer have a monarch, you sort of start substituting the monarch for other institutions and start making suppositions about those institutions that might not be accurate or reflective of reality. Do you have a preferred system of government then or a system like I'm not sure. I'm I'm kind of I've been fluctuating a lot politically and ideologically for the last few months as I think about things. I'm not sure what we have is bad because I'm not sure that isn't to say that everything that liberalism has yielded is bad. I think there is absolutely a strong case to be made and a very powerful case to be made for the necessity of having a feedback system by which the people can give consent for for being governed. Yeah. But that doesn't mean that the metaphysic that the an ideology is based in is not ultimately corrupted and does not ultimately need to be replaced by something that can draw similar conclusions to it in a number of ways, but is based in a different sort of metaphysic or meta narrative. I think my, the, the way I'm leading right now is I effectively think a society based in, if not a strictly Christian meta narrative about the ultimate goal of humanity being to be made be made subject to be be willfully made subject to a higher power and a god willfully and the subject to yeah. Well, no, no, but like... That seems uh, like an oxymoron. That sounds like an oxymoron, and in purely secularist terms it is, but I think when you... In uh, in Mere Christianity, C.S. Lewis makes the observation that only by giving everything that we have and noting that everything that we are is ultimately the result of God and a gift from God, do we truly become free and can we truly meaningfully be ourselves? I think C.S. Lewis makes a lot of circular arguments. That you have to, like, as as he's trying to convince you to believe in God, you have to believe in God to believe his convincing. Have you read Mere Christianity? It's on my list. I haven't read it yet. Because it, it's a lot less circular than you would think. I'm not doing it sufficient justice. And frankly, I have ADD and I'm very scatterbrained. Have you, like, is, is that something I should read? Is that a recommendation? Yeah. Mere Christianity is really higher good. up on my list. Yeah. If, if you wanted something that wasn't necessarily, um, I really, really like the screw tape letters. I was listening to that on audiobook on a, on a, on a drive with my wife recently. That was, uh, that was fun. If you, are you familiar with the screw tape letters at all? Yeah. I remember you, you told me about that many years ago. Do you remember what it's about? It's just, it's just C.S. Lewis writing writing letters flexing on everybody. Yeah. Isn't that one like writing letters to the devil or something like that? No, no. It's, um, Screwtape is the name of of an arch demon in hell who is yeah. writing to his nephew Wormwood, who is a entry level tempter, whose job it is to guide his subject away from the hated clutches of heaven and God and toward hell, where he can be consumed. And it makes right. a lot of it is a very interesting analysis of both the problems of modern society, the problems of modern Christianity, the problems of, of hubris, and a lot of other things that I am I am really quite a fan of. Yeah, I'll have to read that one too. 
maybe we could talk about that on a future episode. Oh, I would, I would adore that. That would, uh, that would tickle me. I would be tickled. My general idea is that uh, a lot of these religious arguments can be okay if taken metaphorically, but when taken literally, they become kind of insane. No, I, I, I disagree. I disagree <laughs> strongly. I, I think there is significantly more reason and logic to the Christian theological tradition and the Christian ideological tradition and understanding of the world than is being granted by modern intellectuals and modern society as a whole. Would that make you against positivism then? How so? I'm not sure you can... Well, because it's about empirical evidence. I never uh... said positivism is about understanding our world. Yeah. Not necessarily about understanding. And this is the other thing too, is positivism is a standard. I think there needs to be a standard. And one of my problems with critical theory is it doesn't offer a standard. It just says all the standards that we have are shitty and bad. Right. So I'm just asking if you think positivism isn't a good standard in your eyes. I think it is or, for I think I think it's a good standard for secular matters. Although I, mean, I think that I think okay, there is significantly more historical evidence that is concrete historical evidence for the existence of Jesus Christ and a lot of other weird things that happened than I, I think there is a lot of positivist, falsifiable evidence for Christ. Existing or being God? Existing and also necessarily being God. Well, maybe we shouldn't get into religion on this specific episode of the podcast, but <laughs> that last thing you said sounds uh, interesting. <laughs> well, it, it depends on what you count as per- permissible as evidence. and it depends I would on... think a historian should have a high standard for this. Yes, I think the... I, I do have I do have a high standard for this, but it also depends on whether or not you think that something that happened. There, 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 there's a whole thing. Like you, 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 I know, but you, you could see that like maybe Jesus existed, but by oh, well, the G- fact that Jesus he existed, certainly existed. It's the things that happened. Are, we know that there, there is there is there is not a biblical historian, atheist or otherwise, from my understanding at this point, who denies the existence, existence sure. of Jesus as, as a physical human that existed. It's the sure. things that happened around Jesus and the amount of stuff that was recorded by outside non-Christian sources that. And, and then it gets into, a lot of this gets into metaphysics, and a lot of this gets into stuff that necessarily cannot be tested by, by positivist means, right. but, that, that's, does, that's but, but that doesn't mean that it's not falsifiable. There's a difference between something being, being positivist and being non-falsifiable. How could something not be testable but be falsifiable? What, what it, no, 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 but positivism isn't just about testing something. It's about, from my understanding, it's, it's, it's about being able to observe phenomenon and measure phenomenon. Yeah. So how, how can you measure Jesus's resurrection? Um, I th- no, well, you you can't measure his resurrection itself, or anybody else's me- resurrection. Exactly, but you can measure the, but you can observe the historical record of what happened following that, and the things that those people who claimed that he came back from the dead did. Right, and what. Particularly, I, practically all of the apostles were killed in horrible, monstrous ways over long periods of time. And I've heard all, this argument before. I'm, I'm aware, and I'm not saying you necessarily need to find it compelling. Um, what, what I'm saying is is that, and and there's significantly more to it than this, I, I should say. Again, I'm not super up on my theology. I would need to uh, do some more reading, and I would need to do some more some more prep in order to be able to meaningfully elaborate on it. But I would say, number one, it's not circular. And number two, I would be very surprised if Christ... I would be very surprised if I died... Well, I wouldn't be surprised if I died and there was no God and there was nothing. Um, I wouldn't be upset either because... You wouldn't be able to be surprised. Exactly. I wouldn't be able to be surprised because I I, I wouldn't be. And that's certainly a possibility. I'm I'm not saying that I, I am certain of any of this. I think even the most devout Christians have deep seated uncertainty. I think I think that's a necessary and natural part of any spiritual belief. That, at least to me, is reassuring. This, this, this isn't me saying that I am objectively right, and I would, I would just... I, I don't know, because when, when you start talking about like metaphysics and the soul, what, what can you bet, or what can you say that would meaningfully you know, do something in that regard? I think there is sufficient historical evidence that it is a reasonable conclusion to come to, and I think... Depending, and that depends on your attitude. That, that Jesus was God. 
Yes. Um, well, and 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 it's it's the conclusion that the conclusion that Jesus rose. If Jesus rose from the dead, he is necessarily God. Well, I disagree with that one, but okay. Well, I think I think that in and of itself is significantly more. I think that if there is a God, and and this is something that you might disagree with, but but based on the the, the reading and theology that I do already. But but I think that if there is a God, and I think we spoke about this that one time I was high on mushrooms. <laughs> but if 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 there is a God, he is necessarily if there is a God of any description, a prime sure. mover, a force, he is necessarily the God described in the in the bible or at least the bible comes the closest to meaningfully describe him compared to any other religious text i don't see how anyone could gather that conclusion i think um except for the fact that they believed the bible before believing what you just said then yes of course they believe that well no 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 no. i think well maybe but i think there's something to be said for the i came to this conclusion after reading uh, kierkegaard and his sort of the, the, the Christian Christian his th- his whole idea was was to believe because it is absurd to believe to an extent yeah so he was basically rejecting rationality he wasn't rejecting rationality that- he was embracing existentialism it's a di- it's a different kind of absurd existentialist right. philosophy is a, is yeah. a whole different yeah. thing and, and what qualifies as the absurd yeah. is and and what constitutes the absurd and why something meets the criteria of being absurd is a whole different thing in in existentialist philosophy and there's kind of a whole theological thing around i think there is a tradition of christian apologism compared to other religions not having the same thing because Christianity necessarily gives rise to and places value in the truth. If it was true that there was no God, and there was a way to prove that objectively, there, the moral Christian thing would be to give in to that assertion. I think Christianity I like allows the, the... it. I think Christianity allows itself to be subjected to and tested by certain standards of evidence and certain 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 means outside of itself more than any other faith in history. And I think that's, that speaks to its credit. And I think there is a, I would need to do some more reading on this subject, but there's sort of a, what seems to make sense to me, a, a and many of the people who, one of the reasons I'm, I'm, I'm as convinced by C.S. Lewis as I am and find his arguments regarding, because he makes that argument, I believe in mere Christianity. It's been a few years since I've read it. And I came to that conclusion more or less after I read it. And I that in sure combination with Kierkegaard. I read all of his books. Not all of his books. You don't have to read all of no, his no. books. He's, he's written a no, lot. No, I, I know. I've, I've been planning for a while to read all of his books and make a debunking video about them. Really? Yes. I, I he's crazy. Really? Oh, yes. Really? Uh, he, he's, he, a, he's a great writer. I love, I love Narnia and I love his, his letters, but most you, people can, can be intelligent and crazy at the same time. You are aware that he was an ardent atheist for the majority of his life. Oh, yeah. That doesn't make him any less crazy. Might make him more, actually. Crazy? Uh, on, on what grounds? Okay, if I told you that I believe in a fluffy pink unicorn whose name is Charlie, and he tells me what to do, would you think I'm crazy? Is there historical evidence for the existence of Charlie? I think so. Really? Uh, or even could, if there could... wasn't. Are you saying there needs to be historical evidence of God to believe in God? There needs to be historical evidence of Jesus to believe in Jesus. Would you not believe in God then without Jesus? Probably not, no. I feel like that kind of takes away all of the credits or all of the... um faith that christianity so admires christianity is do... about blind it's not about blind faith though there's a difference between blind I, I think your idea of what christianity is is informed by a very and this isn't this isn't me criticizing you exclusively i think there's a very shallow evangelical tradition in the united states that sort of precludes itself from the sort of and and is there's a fucked up shallow american christian evangelical tradition that i sure. i am i despise and that sort of makes up or comprises your understanding of what constitutes christian belief and standards but if you have evidence then you can't have faith because you don't need it anymore no, that's not true because evidence points to a likely conclusion or a body of likely conclusions yeah sure and also Which is still different from faith because you can you can like have 99 percent confidence in what you believe and then I feel like faith is that extra one percent of taking it to the illogical limit. I did, well, number one, I think you need to. What needs to be appreciated is uh, some of the context around Christian faith and some of the underlying assumptions regarding Christian faith, which is that Christian moral suppositions 
are meaningless unless there is a god. Or I are me- that. I understand that you reject you, that. You can still you can still have morals if you take these things metaphorically. No, 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 no. I'm not saying you can't have morals. What I'm I'm saying well, then how a Christian set of, no what I'm saying is a Christian set of moral suppositions is based on I'm saying in order to come to those conclusions from a like Christian angle it, it, to okay. people arrive at conclusions by walking down logical pathways right like yeah. you, you pick a path and then you walk down it and you find things along that path sure. in order in order for Christian more a uh, Christian moral understanding of the world to be accurate requires that there be a god and requires that that god be a trinity and yeah. that and all of that and yeah. once that no longer becomes true you need to create an entirely new metaphysic base upon which your moral considerations are built and sure. if you frankly i'm not sure i'm equipped to have this conversation meaningfully and may and make and meaningfully defend it at this point no that's all right i mean we kind of got off topic anyway yeah we did I always just find talking about religion and theology interesting, especially with people who disagree with me. Hmm. Anyway, we've been recording for about almost three hours. Yeah, I see that. Do you have any final thoughts before we conclude this episode? Yeah, yeah. I would, um, I would say I don't think critical theory is bad for the sake of being bad. I think critical theory as a tool to examine the claims of other ideologies or of other means of discerning reality and other historical or sociological methods is a necessary part of being rigorous. I think when taken on its own and when accepting the and when accepting many of the axiomatic underpinnings of critical theory, you end up with entropy. By itself, critical theory is an intellectually entropic force. It will it will lead to the heat death of intellectualism, I think. All right. How's how's that for a for a for a final word of wisdom? I think that's pretty good. Yeah, th- thanks for joining me on episode three. Yeah, of this yeah, podcast. We, we should we should talk a little bit after this is done to so that we can talk about what you what you think about all this bullshit that I just said off the air. Oh yeah, sure. Yeah, we should we should we, we do, can that. do that. Well, thank you for listening. Thanks, Nate, for coming on. Oh, my pleasure. And I, I must hope... have been talking really loud because I can I can feel my voice is kind of strained now. But that's fine. You definitely were talking louder than I was. Well, I talk loudly in general because I have I'm I'm a weirdo who's who's. I'm kind also of... not sure if it's the state of our microphones because I think I might actually be recording quietly. I but... think I just I think what it is is I insulated myself from from the sound of my own voice, so I couldn't tell how loud I was being, yeah. and I have a hard time telling how loud I'm being just by feeling my vocal cords. No, oh, that's beside the point. Well, that's okay. Anyway, thank you. I'm gonna stop recording now. Do it.